Hey everyone, Pastor Grant here. We're so glad that you've made the decision to join us today. And uh, we're expectant that in this time together that we would experience the living God through the message that we're about to hear. We also hope that this resource, along with, with us being connected to a local church, would help us in taking our next steps with Jesus, whatever those may be. So let's be encouraged as we open the Bible today. Man, I've been wanting to get up here. I, I had to beg to preach. It's been a couple years. Um, but I, I'm excited to explore Psalm 133 with you this morning. And I'm excited to be with the people that God brought today. And I'm not really sure how your week's gone or your year's gone. It may have been a great year or a great week, or it may have been really difficult with lots of struggles. But you're here, and there's a reason for that. I fully believe that, that God wants to speak to you. All summer long, we've been in a series called The Songs of the Soul, and we've already seen that there's a variety of psalms, and for the third week in a row, we will have a psalm of ascent. Uh, Pastor Sedler and Pastor Kelsey shared with you that they're called psalms of ascent because these were songs, psalms, that were sung going into Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is at a higher elevation. You would always hear Jesus say, let us go up to Jerusalem. There are valleys everywhere. And so it would be fitting to say, we're going to ascend to a higher elevation. And so what I want you to picture is thousands and thousands of Jews on pilgrimage coming into, ascending into Jerusalem. And they're actually singing our text from today. This was the official hymn book of God's people, all 150 psalms. But they're also poetry. And as a literary genre, poetry really invites you to enter into the text. It allows you to kind of dream and wonder and digest what's happening. And so today, King David, the king of Israel, who writes this psalm, is inviting all of us this morning to come into this picture, to jump into the text. And the picture he paints is amazing. It's a picture of unity, the beauty of unity. Before we get there, I'm going to tell a quick story. I think it's quick. About 15 years ago, to celebrate our 10th anniversary, my wife and I went to Banff National Park in Canada. Anybody been to Banff National Park? And we decided we were going to go to Lake Louise, which is a pristine glacial lake. And the first thing that strikes you is the color. Do we have the picture up there? Yeah, look at this. <laughs> look how young we were. There's some dude in a canoe. I don't know what that guy's doing over there but it was just gorgeous. And we're in front of Chateau, um, Chateau Lake, um, where'd it go? What is it called? <laughs> we're in front of Chateau Lake Louise. And you know, there's people mulling around, getting pictures like we're getting pictures, but there's a boardwalk that goes all the way around the lake. And most people were content to just get their picture taken, but my wife and I were not content. We decided we were gonna walk around the lake. So at this point, there's a little sign that says, danger, avalanche season. Well, my wife's from Colorado. She likes mountains. It's our 10th anniversary. I have to continue to look manly. I'm prideful. So I'm like, yeah, babe, let's do it. Let's keep going. So we keep going, and the stream is getting smaller, and it's getting chalkier and milkier. And we're like, we want to get to the top. We want to get to the highest spot we can. After about 30 minutes, there's a guy returning, and we say, hey, how, how is it up there? He says, well, there's about six snowfields. The first five are pretty easy. The sixth is really tough. The seventh, you can barely get past. We thought, let's go. Let's go. We're like in tennis shoes. We have one water bottle between the two of us. <laughs> So we go across the snow field, and I'm like, oh, sweet, a walking stick. Uh, it was actually the tree that the snow had, like, crushed, which <laughs> was a hint to stop. But no, we kept going, and we got past the fourth and the fifth snow field, and we get to the sixth snow field, and we're halfway across the seventh, and we are just 
dwarfed by the majesty of God. I mean, I think we have a picture of finally getting up there. I mean, we are up there. It is stunning. The views of the lake are better than they ever were in front of the chateau. It was hard work to get up there. We stood there and we yelled, ah, this is amazing. God, you're so good. And then we heard like an avalanche, maybe caused by us. <laughs> and my wife's like, we're out of here. So she goes down and, and I'm following her as fast as I can. Now, unity is a lot like that hike. You see, most people were content to stay in front of the chateau and get their nice little picture. It's nice there. It's easy there. You can get some snacks there. It's safe. You know, it was, it was good enough. They didn't want to make the effort to get up in the mountains, but they missed out on the beauty. They missed out on the source of the beautiful turquoise water. And those who refuse to be people who risk and labor and climb towards others in unity will never know the beauty. They will never understand the blessing that awaits them. I'm going to warn you, it's risky. It's dangerous. It may hurt or humble you to be unified with others that you disagree with, but you will never experience the beauty or the euphoria of such a state. So you ready to go on a journey with me? You ready to go on a hike towards unity? You ready to enter into the text and the beauty of unity? Well, I'm going to give you a little road map. Every map is important if you're going on a hike. So here's where we're going. Unity is stunning. Unity is fragrant. Unity is refreshing. Unity is Trinitarian. Unity is our greatest apologetic tool. And unity is mankind's greatest obstacle. It's our greatest obstacle. So 133 says this. A song of ascent of David. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head, running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life evermore. Will you pray with me briefly? Lord, we come to your text acknowledging that those are your words. Yes, you penned them through King David, but they are your words for your people for today. And so we pray that we would humbly submit to your holy word, knowing that it doesn't return empty or void. And it's my prayer that these people who would hear this today would be stirred towards unity, Lord, that they would labor towards the mountaintops of unity so that they could view all the glory that is found when God's people are united. Father, I pray that you would take away my sin. I am a man of unclean lips. I pray that my own sin would not interfere with your message. Father, cleanse me as I come now to share your word with your people. I pray this in your name. Amen. This is actually a pretty easy psalm to preach. <laughs> it's um, when, when Grant said Psalm 133, I'm like, yes, because it, it starts with a thesis statement. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. David's saying, hey, church, this is written to the church. Remember, this is their hymn book. This isn't the hymn book for the Babylonians. All right, it's not the hymn book for the Philistines. It's a hymn book for the church, and he's saying, church, how good and pleasant it is when you dwell together in unity. And then David kind of proves his thesis statement. He wants to show us what unity looks like by way of a simile. He describes how good and pleasant this kind of life is to God and to those who participate in it. So we're going to look at this description. The first is that unity is stunning. Nobody says, behold, anymore. They just, they don't talk that way. 
but David did. And he's saying, hey, hey, guys, look, you, you've got to check this out. Would you let your eyes just fixate on the beauty of unity? It's like when my wife and I were hiking, we'd, we'd turn a corner and you're like, oh, my gosh. How, how could this get more beautiful? And you don't just keep hiking, you just you stop. And you, you look, you're mesmerized by the staggering beauty in front of you. And the same thought's going on here with King David. He says, look how good it is. Please just stop and behold how pleasant it is to dwell in unity. It's such a valuable thing to behold. So much so that David, I think as he's writing this, he's like, this is a song. Oh, this is a song. I wonder how we should sing this. And he, and he, he seems to be getting excited, and he breaks out, and he says, well, this, this unity is like precious oil. No, it's like the dew of Hermon. No, it's, it's like life evermore. And he just, I can just see him getting ramped up as he pins this song for the people of Israel to sing. And so let's look at those things. We already said unity is stunning, but it's also fragrant. Verse 2, it is like the precious oil on the head running down the beard on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. In the Old Testament, Aaron was the high priest, and he would be the representative of the people of God. He would petition God on behalf of the people, and to set him apart through his ordination service, they would pour oil on him. But not just any oil. The text says it's, it's precious oil. It would be the best of oils, and it would be fragrant it would have been blended with myrrh and cinnamon and cane and cassia. And David said it was used in such abundance, so much so that it's, you got to picture this, it's just flowing down his beard. It's covering his head and it's going down his robe. It is, you thought you got wet at the baptism. I mean, oil everywhere. And it would have been fragrant. Everybody would have smelled it. It would have absolutely saturated the air. Unity is fragrant. After I graduated from the UW, no booze, please, from the Cougs out there, um, I, I went on a summer mission trip to Scotland. And the best part about the mission trip was just living with Scottish people. And they're super hospitable. Uh, it's also kind of cold and rainy in Scotland, even in the summer. So it was, it was really common to have fires at night. And my, my roommate was Andrew, so it was Andrew and Andre. And uh, the Scottish guy would light a fire, and he'd say, Drew for Andrew and Dre for Andre. Drew and Dre, come have a wee drum of whiskey with me. <laughs> and I'm like, um, you know, we're missionaries. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I think I was 21, and I'm like, come have a wee dram of whiskey with me. I'm like, I don't know, I guess I'm supposed to do this. And so Drew and Dre, we, we sit in these chairs and we get our wee dram of whiskey and the fire's going. And if, I think we have a picture of it. Uh, there's peat everywhere in Scotland. And every once in a while, the dad would throw these big chunks of peat onto the fire. It smelled awesome. It was kind of lavendery. And the aroma would just fill the air. And we're just kind of looking at each other and sipping our wee dram of whiskey and <laughs> kind of sinking in the chair a little bit more. And we're laughing. And he's like, let's play the bagpipes. And we're like, of course, let's try. And you know, we're like filling the canter bag up. And I mean, it was awesome. It was festive, it was joyful, it was pleasant. And King David is saying that when we are unified, when followers of Christ are united, that it, it produces this pleasant aroma. That being in community where we, are, where we are united is sweet. Perhaps you've experienced such a time. I bet you have where you're like, this, I don't want this to end. 
I also bet there's times where you're like, I want this to end. This is not unity. This is just discord and bitterness and loneliness. And that would actually reek of death. But David says, when we're unified, it smells so good. It's so good for us. David continues to build his case. He says that unity is also refreshing. We see this in verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life evermore. Does anybody know why David would refer to Mount Hermon here? I learned the hard way why he would refer to Mount Hermon in this psalm. I took a class when I was doing college ministry in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, it was a seminary class up in Charlotte, and I thought, let, let me take a class to see if I want to go to seminary full-time, which I eventually did in St. Louis. But we, we would drive up there with two other buddies, my friends, my so-called friends. And um, it was a four-hour class, and it was hard. It was a hard class, and the professor was brilliant. He memorized all our names in one day, in one class period. And it was uh, very interactive. And he would, remember, it's four hours, once a week, for 10 weeks. He'd call on us all the time. And nobody wants to be called on in class, right? You're like, eh, did I read everything? Did I study? And when he would start to call on somebody, I decided I would do the opposite of what everybody else would do. Everybody else is kind of like, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to look at him. And so he'd get ready to call, and I'd just. <laughs> and he never would call on me. <laughs> Seriously, we're like in week eight. Well, we had a 15-minute break. We had a 15-minute break in this class. And my friends are like, dude, why doesn't Professor Kara ever call on you? And I go, that's easy. I go, I intimidate him. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? I go, when he gets ready to call on somebody, I just look him straight in the eye like, bring it. <laughs> well, I went to get a drink of water or something, and my friends went to Professor Kara. <laughs> and they said, hey, Professor Kara, Lewis thinks uh, he intimidates you and you've never called on him. So we go back into the classroom and we sit down and the professor goes, well, that's how he talked, well, Mr. Lewis, <laughs> what's so special about Psalm 133 in Mount Hermon? And he called on me for the next two hours and only me. <laughs> so we were studying this Psalm. Well, here's what's so special about Mount Hermon. And, and David knows his geography. It's the tallest peak in Israel. Do we have a picture of it up there? I mean, look at that thing. It's kind of the Mount Rainier of Israel. There's snow on it year round. David's like, unity is like that mountain. How is it like that mountain? Well, it's a mountain that supplies life giving water, it's the mountain that brings moisture to the other surrounding mountains to the small mountains and to the valley. And when we dwell in unity, it should have this refreshing effect on us. Unity is refreshing. You know it can be that way. You've been in the company of others where you're unified and it's refreshing, but who is this unity supposed to refresh? Technically, it's supposed to refresh everyone, all people. You see, the text says that the dew flows down from the mighty, powerful Mount Hermon to the somewhat lowly, at least geographically, little Mount Zion. Biblical unity includes the high and the low. It transcends one's age, occupation, income level, nationality, physical stature, stage in life. It refreshes Democrats, and it refreshes Republicans. It refreshes those who are vaccinated. And it refreshes those who are wondering if they should get vaccinated. It refreshes the person who thinks you should homeschool versus the person who thinks you should go to public school. It refreshes those who have different ideas on 
contraceptives, and alcohol. I mean, the list could go on and on, friends. Biblical unity refreshes all people. You know, it's interesting. There's people who are watching some at church. You may not know it. They're, they're eavesdroppers of the faith. And when we are united, they say, man, Summit Church is different. They sure love each other. They even love each other through these really tough things, these really tough political things. How do they do that? What's their secret? I want some of that. Before we move on to some $10 seminary words concerning unity, let's examine ourselves a bit on this topic. Over the past, let's say, 18 months, a time that saw, let's, let's face it, one of the most heated political eras ever in a presidential campaign, coupled with a global pandemic and racial unrest, has the church, has our church, have we been marked and characterized by unity? Would onlookers view our interactions and describe it as stunning, fragrant, refreshing, would they say, I want to be a part of that family? I wonder if there is anybody here today that needs to go to another person in this church family or your family. You should have seen my family thread. <laughs> it was ugly to the point where I was like, guys, we're going we're gonna to lose some relationships over this. Maybe somebody at work where we need to ask them to forgive us because we did not dwell with them in unity. Friends, unity is so important. Unity is the very nature or being of the Trinity. Here comes that $10 seminary word. Unity is Trinitarian. Ontology, there's another $10 seminary word, is a study of being. When we talk about the ontological trinity, we're referring to the fact that God is three in one, the three persons in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who together are one. The structure of the trinity is unity. You mimic the unity, or you mimic the trinity when you're unified. Have you ever thought of that? You mimic the trinity when you are unified. It is the essence of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, there are attributes of God that you can communicate to the world. There are attributes of God that you cannot communicate. They are non-communicable traits. I cannot communicate being all-powerful or all-knowing. God can. However, I can communicate, you can communicate the trait of unity. And when you display that, something very powerful is taking place. I really need you to hear this. Something very powerful takes place when you're unified. You prove the very existence and mission of God. Think about that for a minute. When you're unified with brothers and sisters, you prove the existence and the very mission of God. At least that's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus said in the high priestly prayer because unity is apologetic. John 17, 20 to 23 says this. This is Jesus speaking, okay? I do not ask for these only, he's talking about his disciples, but also those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also believe in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Did you catch that? so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one 
here we go again, so that the world may know that you sent me, and it gets better, and love them even as you loved me. That little word even in the Greek means to the same degree. When you're unified, the world believes the mission of God. It believes that we are loved by Jesus to the same degree that God the Father loved his son, and he loved his son a lot. When we're serving others, not having to always be right, when we're deferring, the world will believe. They will look and say, I think God actually sent Jesus, and that God actually loves these people. That's how important it is and how crucial it is for mankind. It is through our unity that Jesus says people will come to believe in him. Unity is one of some of its greatest apologetic tools, one of its greatest witnessing tools. Let me encourage you to strive for such unity. Make amends, seek forgiveness, ask forgiveness in your own congregation. Please don't be content to sit back at the hotel. It, the hotel was nice, don't get me wrong. We loved it. We had high tea and cucumber sandwiches. But it was nothing compared to the hike and the views and the mountains. Don't sit back there. Get on the boardwalk. Venture into the difficult terrain. Cross the relational snowfields and even the avalanches in your life so that you can behold the beauty of unity. Why? Because that's what Jesus did for us. And this too is crucial to understand. My final point, unity is the greatest obstacle between God and mankind. For there the Lord has com commanded the blessing, life evermore. Where is he? There? He's on Mount Zion. We were just talking about this. For at Mount Zion, the Lord commanded the blessing, life evermore. We're talking about unity. God is referencing a blessing that takes place on Mount Zion, a blessing of life forever. Does anybody know where Mount Zion is in Israel? It's where the greatest blessing ever took place. It's where life forevermore was pronounced. Mount Zion is in Jerusalem. It's in the city of David. David's city, he says, right there in Jerusalem, the greatest blessing took place, but an obstacle had to be overcome. God was at enmity with mankind, and David knows this. He knows the greatest obstacle between God and mankind is our sin. Listen to what he writes in Psalm 51. Check this out. You know what he just did? He just committed adultery with this lady. And then he got her pregnant. And he didn't want to get found out. So then he had her husband killed. He said, let's go to war. And when, when he's there, everybody retreat. So he gets killed. And he's like, uh, that was bad. I'm going to write a song about how bad that was. <laughs> Wasn't his most popular song. And he says, have mercy on me, God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. He even knew before he did all this terrible stuff. He's like... I've been born in sin. I have a problem. I have an obstacle to get to my Savior. Did, did King David know what would happen in Jerusalem to bridge the gap between God and man? Friends, God wanted to have unity with you. With you. But like David, the sin in our lives and our hearts and in our minds separates us from a holy God. Mount Zion, the blessing is pronounced forevermore. Mount Zion in Jerusalem, it was in Jerusalem that God dealt with our lack of unity. 
by allowing his son Jesus to be killed. He obliterates the chasm between you and God. And at the cross, we are finally united to Christ. At the cross, Jesus takes our sin and gives us his glorious perfection. And now, and only now, is it possible for us to be united with God. Did you see the journey Christ went on to bridge this gap? Talk about a nice chateau. He left his heavenly chateau. He's like, it's, it's nice here. Hey, Holy Spirit, God the Father, I got to go though. And he leaves. And he journeys as a man through this boardwalk of life. And he, he sees the snowfields approaching. He says, I got to cross them. I got to cross them for my people. They, they will never be united to my Father or to me or to the Spirit unless I cross them. And he saw the avalanche of the wrath of God that would be poured out on him for your sin and for my sin. And he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway for you, for his bride. That is how the blessing, life forevermore, comes to us. So unity is, it's breathtaking. It is, it's fragrant, it's refreshing, it mimics the character of God. It's used by God to draw people to him. And it's, it's how he forgives our sins and unites us to him. Guess what starts tomorrow? Masks. I'm so glad I got to preach this Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not looking forward to it. Running a ministry to at risk youth and changing things and canceling things. And I mean, you're going to get tested very quickly tomorrow. Unity. How are you going to respond? How is someone going to respond? Man, I pray we're united. I really do for these reasons. I want to encourage you to do so. Please do it. The world's watching. We, we can't be like everybody else. We can't. We cannot. We are not. We are different. We are set apart. If Aaron was set apart, we have been set apart. So that's my prayer for us. It's going to be hard at times. Right? The snow fields are coming. The journey, you're going to run out of water. You got your tennis shoes on when you should have had your hiking boots on. All that stuff. But it's worth it. I promise you. You can still disagree and love somebody. You can still be united. What are we united under? As the people of God, we're united under the blood of Jesus Christ, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We have everything. He has everything. He's, he's in control. Fight for unity. Fight for it in your family. Fight for it in your marriage. Fight for it in your church. Jesus fought for it. Fought hard. And he won. Will you stand with me? I can't remember. Do we have another song? It's been a while since... I'm going to baptize you. All right. No song, but maybe there was supposed to be a song. Sorry, worship team. Love you. Um, <laughs> hey, um, we close with a benediction. And my favorite benediction is the ironic, not ironic, ironic, Aaron, the high priest. And this is the benediction that he gave to the people after he met with God. He said, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you in uh, seven days, I think, right? We'll be here. We'll be here. All right. Bye. So glad that you joined us today. We hope that you have been filled up, challenged, encouraged by what you heard. Our desire for you is that this resource be used in conjunction with you belonging to a local church so that you can grow in the context of community Following Jesus isn't something that we're meant to do alone. So if something from worship or the message was stirred up inside you today as you listened, we encourage you to bring others into that. Tell the story of what God is speaking to you and what he's leading you to. 
If you're in the Spokane area, we would love for you to join us in person for services. If you have questions or you need prayer, you can fill out a Connect card on our website and a member from our team will reach out to you. You'll also see opportunities there to join a community group, to get baptized, or to get involved in, by serving with us. If you're not local, we encourage you to get connected with a church that's near you so that you can follow Jesus with others and grow in your faith and be transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. For other opportunities to connect with us, you can check out our website or look for us on social media. We love you all. Hope you join us again.